Good evening, everybody. My name is Nancy Easterling, and it is my privilege to serve as the Executive Director of Historic Sauterly. And we're welcoming you to, tonight to our kickoff event for our 2021 Common Ground Initiative. This is certainly a momentous day in our nation's history, a time when many people are looking toward the future with hopes of coming together and finding common ground and unity. And how fitting that tonight is our Common Ground event and our first one for the new year. Our Common Ground initiative started four years ago, so this will be its fourth season. And five years ago, we formalized our Descendants project. We have over 200 self-identified descendants as part of our registry from 30 states and four countries. The realities of their ancestors are defining Sauterly's past for us in new ways as their stories come out. And our descendants and their willingness to share their stories and be part of the conversation are helping to define Sauterly's future. I am beyond thrilled that tonight, our kickoff event is one of our beloved Sauterly descendants, Jerome. And I am just so thrilled that he is here tonight and going to do this wonderful presentation for us. I am going to turn over the uh, rest of the introductions and uh, the instructions to our wonderful Director of Educational Programming and Partnerships, Jeannie Pirtle. I know you are all going to enjoy this evening as much as I am. Let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and uh, I'll just give you some uh, direction. Uh, many of you are already uh, introducing yourself. Tell us where you're from, um, and uh, chat with chat with us. And that's also where you're going to pose your questions to uh, Mr. Spears when we're uh, to the Q and A portion of the program. So please uh, post your questions up there too, and I will remind you, okay? So let's uh, get started. Mr. Jerome Spears is a native of Baltimore. Uh, he started his undergraduate work at Morgan State University, and he's a graduate of the University of Hawaii. His degrees are in geography, and they have served him well in assisting his approach of meticulously positioning his ancestors within the historical context of place and time in order to uncover and reveal some remarkable and amazing family history discoveries. In 2015, he documented the history of his eight linear ancestral families rising out from slavery to freedom and beyond in a nationally award-winning manuscript entitled, I've Got Your Back. He has presented it national level conferences, including the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, which is also a member, and Root Tech Connect. In 2020, he found and successfully made contact with his family, Kunta Kente. His regional focus continues to be nested in Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Virginia, with some compelling links to North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Louisiana, Alabama, the UK, Ireland, and the West African countries of Ghana, Sierra Leone, Senegal, and Nigeria. He is a retired 30-year U.S. Army veteran who, okay, and uh, who over that same period of time experienced some levels of success as a musician and record producer as well as a professional boxing commentator. He now adds family historian, lecturer, and truth seeker to his titles as he continues to answer the call of his past relatives. So uh, let me present Mr. Jerome Spears. Thank you, Jean. thank you very much. And thank you to all the folks who are in attendance tonight. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is to cover over the next 40 minutes or so um, a series of slides that will hopefully be informative and entertaining. Um, if I go through a slide too fast, uh, certainly let me know. And when we do the Q and A on the back end, we can circle back and, and try to catch up. Um, with that, let's get started. So 
Today, we're going to be talking about Soderly and a whole lot more. I say a whole lot more because Soderly is located in St. Mary's County, more generally Southern Maryland. Southern Maryland, where the history is long and deep. It includes the activities of presidents, governors, landowners, merchants, kings, popes. It includes the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And reflecting on the times we find ourselves in today, it is appropriate to remind ourselves about the regions, in fact, the country's interactions with the Native American peoples of this nation. We can add to those interactions the over 40,000 vessels which brought 12 million captive Africans to the Americas. As a researcher who has intense interest in reconnecting with distant relatives from the motherland, even taking the first steps of discovery can be like trying to find a needle in a haystack. One thing I'm trying to do is to make the haystack smaller. Historically in this area, the power brokers of the day all played a hand in riddling the coastline with arriving human cargo for hundreds of years. Yes, I'm interested in the Margaret, which landed in Annapolis in 1718, as well as the generous Jenny, which met up with James Bowles on the Patuxent in 1720 at what, at what amounts to be now the Solid Plantation. But I'm also interested in many of the other ships, ships where the people were unknown and the narratives were untold. Uh, there were over 6,000 folks that I'm trying to keep track of in this endeavor. Most of these folks on this refined list that I've created have an origins in Maryland. At least in some way, either direct or indirect. And my screen just went blank. I don't know if I hit something. Let's see if I can make that go away. Oh my. We we can still see your slides. You say you can? Yes. Can. It's part two of three. So. Okay. So I, I must have hit something wacky, but I think I'm back now. Okay. So this is part two of three. And then part three shows the final slide, which shows about 6,000 individuals that I have captured in a smaller list from that 12 million that I'm going to hopefully at some point be able to probe a little more and do some discovery and maybe in the future, make some connections. Okay. So in terms of making any possible connections, uh, one has to look at the challenge of over 200 years of the period called enslavement, where all kinds of things went on. Landowners all intermarried as they sought to successfully jockey for position, status, land, wealth, and power, while at the same time resisting the various pressures they were facing from Europe. These and other factors all combine to create a situation over time from a DNA perspective where just about everyone would end up being related on some level to everyone else. And there's a term for that. From a DNA perspective, trying to trace back over the various family lines can quickly get blurred, to say the least. In my own case, my, my ethnicity estimates are indicative of many interactions and exchanges with various parts of the world. Per results from Ancestry.com, I'm about 83% African and 17% European. But why swim in one lake? 
when DNA, other DNA tests can be obtained. In my case, my overall breakdown when considering the variety of testing companies, I'm about 80% African and 20% European. Another data point, three of my four grandparents were all brought up within 15 miles of each other in St. Murray's County. From Hollywood to Leonardtown to Valley Lee, that's a lot of opportunity for allowing the properties of endogamy to go into overdrive. With overlaying what I like to call the ultimate truth serum of DNA into the study of my family tree, particularly where heavily, heavy endogamy is likely, you've got to have a strong and deep bench of relatives to draw upon in order to best position yourself to accurately locate and resolve your recent and even distant ancestors. So manage and make use of your army of DNA data efficiently. This army or deep bench coupled with autosomal DNA testing and analysis can support your research discoveries going back several generations. That same network of cousins will afford you an opportunity using Y DNA for the paternal line and mitochondrial DNA for the maternal line to determine parts of your family origins going back thousands of years. So using all of the DNA testing options that are available today can put you in the center of a great deal of information, which in turn can have a positive outcome on many of your discovery efforts. What a time it is to be a citizen scientist and genealogy researcher. So many resources and tools are available for use. Certainly being able to see and evaluate the amount of DNA related individual share as expressed in CMs or Center Morgan values can in many cases set you well on your way to validating family relationships. This is a cheat sheet I use, and by the way, there are many other more comprehensive methods of evaluating Center Morgans, but this sheet has proven to work well for me. Viewed another way, the higher number CMs values, looking at my parents, my siblings, and to the right, my first cousins, they can be helpful in identifying close and very close relatives. While my second through six cousin matches can be used in many cases to push your deep discoveries and validations back to the period when many of those enslaved sea vessels I spoke about earlier first arrived on the shore of Maryland. And you can see that 10 centimorgan value associated with 1740, all the way to the back where it says deep research. So we can talk about Southern Maryland. It's a discussion that will oftentimes prove to be complicated, challenging, and even at times difficult. Certainly much has been said and written about the power brokers of the day. But we can now also ensure that our, that available viewpoints and, narr and narratives are brought up to cover folks that haven't been spoken about before. Be it Southerly or the Georgetown GU-272, the Susquehanna Plantation Narrative, Society Hill and Rosedale Manor, or the Jordan family properties over in Valley Lee. There are fundamental narratives that need to be shared. This segues nicely into my next point, my mission statement, if you will, which centers on four things. To honor what history and other research has been passed down, to prepare the next generation of family to be knowledgeable enough to continue this now long running effort to let those that know that follow 
know from whence they came to speak for those who could not speak for themselves and to use the science to bridge the gap that enslavement caused in terms of reconnecting with Africa. So we want to honor and prepare and speak and bridge. On this forefront, I'm happy to report that we have already recently successfully made contact with distant cousins from Nigeria and Senegal. Our hunt continues. So on to Maryland and tapping another leg of the mission statement. Let's let them speak. When you have a place that's been around for as long and has some as well documented as solidly, you could spend a, an entire day on any given family line and still only scratch the surface. That said, today we're going to be talking mostly about the Bankins family line and tie in some solderly links along the way. We can map the Bankins story many years back and at the next breath, bring it all the way forward to the present. Many of you may recognize or know Gwen Bankins shown in the middle. I always like to pour in a little DNA truth serum when I can. So Gwen and I actually link on a number of lines. Regarding the Bankins connection, my great great grandfather, Basil, and her great great grandfather, George, were brothers. Bankins and Jordan links in St. Mary's County go back many years. So from left to right, this foursome of James Leonard Bankins, Louise Marie Stevens, Marion Beatrice Jordan, and Jerome Carter Jordan are credited with laying the groundwork for recurring annual Jordan Bankins family reunions dating back to the 1960s. A tradition carried on by their children and still going on and going strong even today, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. My grandmother in 1979, when she was in her 90s, gave us all a firsthand account of what things were like in St. Mary's County in the late 1880s, living with her previously enslaved grandparents, Basil Bankins and Sophia Marie Camilla Smith. Thanks to my aunt and cousin, we have this narrative captured on tape and we've now moved it to CD for further listening, for future listening. On a lot of ground was covered during those 1979 discussions, both on my grandmother's side and my grandfather's side of the family to be sure. Concerning Basil, we were told that he was enslaved by the affluent Neal family of Charles and St. Mary's County. He had three jobs as a carpenter, a butler, and a family driver. As the driver of the owner, Dr. Frank Neal, he got to move about the county pretty well, transporting Dr. Neal on both business and social visits. Jumping forward in time a little, one of Basil and Camilla's children, William Edmund Bankins, he has the red check all the way to the, to the right, born just after the end of slavery in Maryland, he grew up, left the state, and became a Pullman porter. He spent his adult life living in Chicago, where he kept in touch and wrote his family back east regularly. My grandmother saved two of those letters and we still have them today. Edmund's 1954 letter provided some incredible information. One of the places he mentioned located downriver from Soderley 
on the Patuxent River was the Susquehanna Plantation. We call Susquehanna our first miracle house because years after slavery, the Civil War and other events, the structure had been worn down over time. And by the Second World War, it was about to be demolished uh, to be, make room for the runways at the Naval Air Station, which was being built there until none other than famous automobile maker Henry Ford, and he's on the left there, was convinced to save it, move it to Michigan, restore it, make it part of his indoor outdoor museum where it still stands today. Edmund's mother, Camilla Smith, she was a nurse, a seamstress, and the personal maid of the affluent Carl family. And she spent the first 32 years of her life enslaved on this plantation. During our visit to Dearborn, Michigan, and this is the slide of the photo on the lower right, we left the Ford folks with a lot of information, including photocopies of our Camilla Smith. I say photocopies because the original is still mounted on a living room wall in West Baltimore, where I'm certain my uncle and cousins plan for it to stay. Camilla Parham, may she rest in peace, also mounted on that living room wall, was named after her great grandmother, Camilla Smith. When we are permitted access to the Naval base at Patuxent, we always make a point to pay tribute to our Smith, Bankins, and other families who were enslaved there all of those years ago. Just west and south of Leonardtown, and Leonardtown is kind of all the way to the right, all the way to the left under the word plantation. There was another plantation known as Society Hill. While it may be best known now for being a location, the location of an area golf course, back in the day, Society Hill was the plantation home of Dr. Francis Neal. He was a landowner, farmer, and country doctor. Dr. Neal lived at Society Hill with his wife, family, including his son, Frank Jr., as well as his enslaved population, which included my great-great-grandfather, Basil Bankins. Frank Jr. and Basil were about the same age, and oral history tells us that they grew up together, played together, and did everything together. Basil was Frank Sr.'s driver and butler, and Basil was also Frank Jr.'s close mate. In 1979, as our grandmother told us her firsthand accounts of what she was told and saw as a child in St. Mary's County, we, the children and grandchildren, were taking part in a master class of African-American history and education which got more intriguing as she went on. Back in the day, the Carls in Patuxent were known for having gatherings and lavish parties among the aristocratic class. These were had to attend events in which folks came from far and near. The Neals of Society Hill would be among the folks who made a point of being in attendance at these Carl events. Basil was the driver. So visualize from left to right, going across the basically the width of the county to attend these events. This slide just deals with the interaction uh, of the owners, uh, which they did do, and they they weren't isolated. They because particularly when you think of uh, their numbers were significantly smaller than their enslaved population, so they kind of had to cooperate to get along and so they were always in touch with one another and working with one another. So over time, Basil, the driver of the Neals, takes a liking to Camilla, the principal maid of the Carols. The two owners allowed the couple to marry in 1850. 
Their marriage did not bring the two of them together as a couple, as Basil was required to remain at Society Hill and Camilla continued on at Susquehanna. A couple of years later, Dr. Neal's son, Frank Jr., now a country doctor as well, planned to marry, move away from his father, and start out on his own. At this point, the Neal family had an important decision that they had to make. What would become of Frank Sr.'s lifelong driver and Frank Jr.'s lifelong friend? It was decided that for the fee of $1,000, Basil would be sold from father to son and moved to Frank Jr.'s new home in Rosedale. Edmund Bankin's 1954 letter speaks to these events as well. And this is where I'm highlighting the, the sale for $1,000 in this slide. And so in 1852, off they went to Rosedale, a move which would make them new neighbors to none other than another area doctor, Walter Hanson Stone Briscoe at Sodderley Plantation. Again, the 1954 letter talks about the move to Rosedale. So by 1852, these three landowners, Briscoe, Neal, and Carl, among others, were all positioned along the Patuxent River. Consequently, Basil was now also closer to his wife, Camilla, and their growing family as well. They would continue to be separated by distance for another 12 years until slavery was finally ended in Maryland on November 1st, 1864. This 1860 census record captures Dr. Briscoe at the top of Sodderley and Dr. Neal of Rosedale Manor at the bottom within close proximity of one another. In current Maryland historical trust documents, they note back in 1862, Dr. Neal having over 300 acres of land at Rosedale Manor. We often speak about the good fortune of having our grandmother around to share her narratives, as well as our great uncle Edmund Bankins for keeping in, in touch with the family back east and writing all of those letters. Certainly, if you are researching in Southern Maryland, the tremendous groundbreaking work of Agnes Kane Callum has to be added to your collection of treasures. Through her and other hardworking folks efforts, we can now study and see many of the previously enslaved names of our family members prior to the 1870 census. This slave statistic record captures among others, the names of my own Basil Bankins and John Lewis Stevens. Basil was on the right and, and John Lewis Stevens is on the left. These next four slides show names, including my own Frank Smith at the very top and his daughter, Camilla Smith Bankins, and she's at the, near the bottom on this page, along with other individuals. We can further pick up this narrative and track this couple after the 1860s. And to do so, I want to jump to the year 1870. In this graphic, many of you will note that Basil and Camilla are finally shown living together. They are off the Patuxent River and residing on Sodderley Road. So whether we are jumping from the 1860s or going back from today to the year 1870, that was an eventful year particularly for African the African-American population, because during this year and this census, they were, for the first time, going to be counted not as property, but as individuals using their full names. The enumerator charged with counting and recording these names was a citizen of the county named John Leach. This is the actual calendar for 1870 
And during that period between Wednesday the 22nd and Wednesday the 29th of June, 1870, John Leach traveled a course that remarkably we can simulate today. Using our imaginations and coming from north to south, if we were to travel along the main route, which runs up and down the length of the county, now known as Route 235, turning left onto Route 245, also known as Soderley Road, or from another perspective, coming from the other direction, you would turn on the Soderley Road, it would be a right turn. You would pass the Shell Station and continue. Oh, but wait, that's right. We're supposed to be simulating the journey of John Leach in 1870. There would be no Shell Station. The roads would not be paved. There would be no automobiles. We are now back 150 years traveling on dirt roads using a horse and buggy. This would have been John Leach's experience. Just to learn a little more about the enumerator, we went searching for him and we believe we found him in 1850 as a much younger man working in the county as a clerk. So moving back to 1870, as John Leach started his duties in Hollywood area, he would have no doubt applied many of his organizational skills he would have acquired working previously as a clerk and systematically traveled from house to house, capturing the needed data to ensure to the best of his ability that no one was missed. We can notice his starting dwelling count from number one to number two to number three and so on. This leg of his work began on what we now know as Flag Day, June 14th. A little more than a week later, on the 22nd, as John Leach approaches dwelling 82, he encounters the, and records Basil Bankins, his wife, Sophia Camilla, and six children, including our very own future Pullman Porter, William Edmund Bankins. They are all present and accounted for. An added footnote, Edmund and his twin sister Hattie were both four years old. This is a correction that was later made on the following census in 1880. The Stevens family, uh, proceeding to dwelling 83, the enumerator next finds the Stevens family, including my grandmother's father, John Lewis Stevens. He's here at age of 19. My Aunt Helena, now herself in her 90s, recalls meeting her grandfather, John Lewis Stevens, better known as Red Stevens, only once. She was a small child at the time, and Red Stevens came to Baltimore, and while visiting, he pulled out his violin and played the tune, Listen to the Mockingbird. What a wonderful childhood memory about Red Stevens, our Aunt Helena was able to pass on to us, just as we are now passing it on to you. A few dwellings down from the Stevens family, we find number 86. And in that dwelling, none other than Dr. Frank Neal Jr. and his family. Note one of the Stevens children, Rose, age 17, still working for him, but now in the capacity of a servant. Proceeding to the next dwellings, 93 and 94, this is still on Thursday the 23rd. The enumerator finds Hezekiah Clark and James Stevens with their families. I've added a photo here of William Mudd Stevens, known from Sodderley Plantation, because he closely relates to his grand uncle, James Stevens. Mudd's grandfather, Abraham Lee Stevens and James Alexander Stevens were brothers. Regarding Hezekiah, the US Colored Troop, North Carolina Civil War veteran, my grandmother as a young girl knew him. They called him Grandfather Clark. 
I would suspect that John Leach, the census enumerator, during his visit, it didn't come up that his real name was Hezekiah Blount. I'm sorry, Blunt. As my grandmother told the story in 1979, Hezekiah was a runaway from the South. When he arrived in Maryland, so as to throw off the slave catchers, he took and used the name Clark. She went on to say that he only used his real name when dealing with official papers and the like. Otherwise, Clark was the name he used and that name stuck for the generations in Maryland who followed. That nugget of oral history helped us in locating Corporal Hezekiah Blunt from North Carolina in the Maryland 1890 Special Vet Veteran Schedule and also in keeping a closer lookout in the future for DNA matches under the name Blunt as well as Clark. She gave us another story in 79 about another couple of cousins. They happened to be identical twins regarding a trick they played on their grandfather Clark one day. But in the interest of time, we'll save that one for another discussion. Proceeding next to Dwelling 97, again, this is Thursday the 23rd. The enumerator finds Dr. Walter Hansen Stone Briscoe and his family at what we all know as Soderley Plantation. Coming out of 1870 and looking forward for a moment, this dwelling shares so much history with so many of my family lines, including Stevens, Barber, and Scriber, to name a few. Pouring in a little more DNA truth serum for good measure, Mud Stevens' first cousin twice removed Joseph Stevens in the center. Bernard Barber's grandnephew, Shelton Barber, in the center. And one of James Victor Scriber's younger sons, Joseph Spencer Scriber, in the center, all record substantial DNA matches to myself, my relatives, on either one or, in some cases, both sides of my family. Regarding Spencer, he matches myself. If you go up to the top center, you'll see my cluster of my siblings. He matches myself, all of my siblings, my niece and nephews. He matches most of my first cousins to the left. And he matches some distant cousins down near the bottom, near the word paternal. These are all on my father's side of the family. And these are confirmed DNA matches. Now back to 1870. At Dwelling 106, this is also on Thursday the 23rd, the enumerator finds Colonel Chapman Bis Billingsley and family, the immediate neighbor to the Sowley Plantation. And on the following day, Friday the 24th, at Dwelling 109, John Leach finds Hillary Kane and family. These, of course, are the family of Agnes Kane Callum and also Gwen Bankins, who has Kane roots as well. On Saturday, the 25th, at Dwelling 145, the enumerator finds Anne Greenwell. And also there we find John and Susan Fenwick. Again, thanks to the outstanding work of Agnes, we know that John Fenwick had previously enslaved, among others, my great-great-grandfather on my father's side, Henry Spears. Another insight that this journey back to 1870 has revealed is that we have found that in a lot of, that a lot of the previously enslaved, just six years removed from getting their freedom, are still living in close proximity to the previous enslavers. Moving forward to Wednesday the 29th at Dwelling 157, consistent with the pattern we've been seeing previously, here's my great-great-grandfather, Henry Spears, with wife Rachel and his family, including my great-grandfather, John Allen Spears, age 13, who later in life weds one of the scribers. And so it goes. 
This journey has started on my mother's side of the family, near where Basil Rankins is pictured, and ends on my father's side, where my great-great-grandfather, Henry Spears, is pictured. When studying family research in St. Murray's County, almost anything is possible. So John Leach had a very interesting week of work as an 1870 census taker. You would almost bet that there would be no way he could have imagined 150 years later people showing this much interest in his work. In so many words, Dr. King once spoke about a day when the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would be able to sit, or in this case, stand at the table of brotherhood. Certainly, in meeting members of the Briscoe family back in 2019, that led to some interesting developments. After explaining to them some of my research interests, Sam Baldwin offered me some cutting room floor dialogue from an old CBS Sunday morning program that Judge Briscoe and Agnes Kane Callum had done back in the 1990s. You never know, something might be there that could be of value, Sam said. I was grateful for the offer and accepted the materials. And looking over what Sam had provided, I noticed while reading that during one of the breaks in filming the TV show, Judge Briscoe turned to Agnes and Darwin. They had very, very close African-American friends. My father used to play with one of the oldest gentlemen, Leonard Bankins. I'm sure you've heard of him. He was a playmate. I jumped up and said out loud, hey, that's my Uncle Leonard. And in that moment of recognition, seeing firsthand the common ground that Agnes and Judge Briscoe had developed, going back a generation earlier and imagining the common ground that Judge Briscoe's dad must, must have forged during much more difficult times with my Uncle Leonard, Going back two generations before that and recalling the treasured 1954 letter that despite differences in their status during the period of enslavement in America, Basil Bankins and Frank Jr., or Little Frank as he was known, found a way on some level to consider themselves in friendly terms. And then fast forward to current times and consider the research assistance rendered in 2019 to a man with whom initial introductions had just been made. Looking forward and looking back, we all got to individually and collectively examine where we have been and where we are going. The various actions or inactions of the power brokers of the past have to now be weighed against what we, the current action officers, are willing and prepared to do in order to breathe true meaning into the phrase liberty and justice for all. Can some of the pieces and, and dysfunctionality of the current environment be put back together? I believe the answer is yes even if it's accomplished finding one discovery at a time. And so I'll end with this final question. America, what are we going to do? And with that, I'll be happy to go back to any slide that I blew through too fast or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spears. Um, that uh, we, we're getting a lot of good feedback about how beautiful the uh, the story was woven together. So there is, there are a few questions, and and um, so I'll get to it. So, what are some of your 
sources and is this info easily accessible without DNA research? Um, I was I, I I would have to say that the the uh, the two letters that Edmund Bankins did, the one in 1910 and the letter in 1954, were were very very helpful primary sources because again he lived with his grand with his parents Basil Bankins and Camilla Smith. My grandmother, she was actually born in Baltimore, but her mother died when she was just two years old. So she was moved from Baltimore to St. Mary's County to be raised by her grandparents, the same two people, Camilla Smith and Basil Bankins. And so she knew a great deal of information too firsthand. And so that 1979 discussion that they had with our family was just tremendous in terms of giving us insights and, and, and little nuggets that would have taken forever to find other ways. Uh, once, once I had that as the foundation, then I was able to go to census records, uh, do all of the normal things that people would do, uh, go to the various archives. I went to the, uh, the historical society at Tudor Hall in St. Mary's County. Um, and, and then I started using the DNA because I wanted to use that truth serum to help to undergird some of the assessments that we were making and be able to work our way back to not only validating and find folks vis-a-vis -vis the DNA, but also use that body of DNA to try to go even beyond that to find some of our kin folks all the way back to Africa. So hopefully I've touched on some of the question or at least the answer to some of the questions with what I just said. Okay. Thank you. And um, I have a question. Um, the date of the Sunday morning program, did somebody answer that already on the chat? What's the I actual date? The, the, the Today Show event in 1996. Okay. Yeah. That was answered. Okay. Somebody did answer that. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't have the date in my head either. So that's right. good. <laughs> right. Okay. And then um, um, how did you get started? Um, I got started. I got started in earnest after my mother passed in 2008. And my aunt Helena had the tape that, that was done by, by my grandmother in 1979. And I, I was there, I was much, much younger, but I was there in 79. And, but I just, I was listening and stuff was sticking, but you have other things going on when you're in your twenties. And so, but you did remember you were there and that we had that discussion. So once my mother passed and my father had died many, many years before, so now you don't have either of your parents and you start thinking about the fact that, okay, your parents aren't here. It's, it's kind of just, you, you know, you kind of, the, the, you got to just, you're on your own, so to speak now, but you want to begin to think about things and lessons and stuff like that. And, uh, so I called my aunt and asked her, I, I want to, I remember my grandmother talked about family history. Do you still have that tape? And she said, of course I have the tape. What do you think I did with it? So she let me see the tape and I was able, it was a cassette tape, but we were able to still play it. And we got it off of cassette tape and into the CD. And so I started listening to the tape. And, and of course, now this was this was the 2000s. My grandmother would say something or my grandfather would say something. You could go in Google or you go to Internet and you hit a few things. And all of a sudden, all this information would come flying at you. So we were in this in a, in information environment where, where stuff was readily available. And so I got started in earnest by listening to that tape again. I guess I was in my, well, I don't know, 40s or 50s <laughs> at that point. And, and and then from that point on, I just started building on trying to validate what was on the tape wherever I could, starting to gather up folks from here and there and getting the DNA and starting to work that portfolio. And um, it just kind of developed from there. And once I began to realize the other thing that I have, because I have five, there's five of, the, of us immediate siblings, and we can do a technique known as sibling summation when you have five siblings and both my parents, we didn't DNA test either one of them before they passed, but having five siblings, you can, you can use that, that combination of DNA to reconstruct the DNA of your parents using first cousins. So we've started doing that. 
And we also knew that if we got second and third and fourth cousins into the mix, again, working with that nucleus, we could then begin to stretch further and further back. So when I showed those slave vessels, those 6,000 individuals on about 40 ships that I've, I've necked down from the 12 million that were brought over over all those years, um, on that list, there, there are many ships that are listed beyond the Margaret and the Generous Jenny and the, the Lord Ligonier and ships that people may be uh, familiar with. And we're able to use DNA getting down to the 10 and 9 and 8 centimorgan range and making match with some of these folks that have African ancestry. And so our belief is that while we've only we found two or three so far, we think we're going to be able to find a lot more. Uh, as we get more people tested. So it's it started with that those tapes. It kind of morphed into the DNA part. And, and now we've just got our sleeves rolled up full blast, just going after it, hoping to find somebody younger who's going to want to come along behind me and start getting interested in this enough to, to want to do a battle handoff and begin to take some of this stuff. So if I get hit by a bus, it would be somebody else that kind of knows where all the all the skeletons are buried and be able to keep this thing going. Okay. So um, there, there are a few other questions that are kind of specific. So I will pick uh, one or two of these. So um, would you have any advice on how to search for the indentured servant history in Chapico and St. Clemens? Do you yeah, have that, any yeah uh, that is, that is specific. Um, I, I would, if you if you know the names of the individuals, I think I would probably just start with, if you could find them in the census records, um, and then maybe even go to uh, the St. Mary's uh, Historical Society. Sometimes if you only have the name and a location, um, the records that they might have there that might be able to help, or even in Annapolis, if you go there. So, so once this pandemic is over and we can start moving around and getting out and about and moving into places, uh, I, I would do some paper trail research, but then I would try to get out and actually go to some of the uh, uh, actual buildings and, and see if there's folks and expertise there that might be able to help you a little further. And uh, uh, one guest asked about, did you run into any roadblocks of, of parents that weren't biologically related? and trying to find your family tree from there. We do have a we do have some instances. We do have some instances that that would fall into that that realm and in some cases uh, all the parties that are involved they're kind of all uh knowledgeable about, you know, the events as they developed and transpired. We probably do have a couple instances maybe where all the parties aren't knowledgeable. And so you kind of have to be, you kind of have to work with that delicately and, and, and proceed cautiously because you, you want to be respectful of people's privacy. And uh, in some cases, if folks have made decisions to, to, to say something or not say something, uh, you, you kind of want to know the background before you just kind of, you're, you're the bull in the China shop, so to speak, just breaking stuff and, you know, so, yeah, we do have some instances like that. And in some cases, everybody knows all of the narrative. But we do have a few instances where probably that isn't the case. So a little bit of both. So would you mind um, telling about um, when you found your ancestors on the continent um, and uh, when that was and how that came about? The ancestor from Africa? Mm -hmm. So... Yes. So a very interesting story. Again, I had to use sibling summation techniques. Uh, if, you're, if you're going back that far, and I don't have the graphic up, but I showed a graphic where you're using your second through six cousins, which will garner you uh, Santa Morgan values that might, that might take you all the way down to the single digit numbers. And depending on who you talk to, some people will say, once you get down to eight, seven, six Santa Morgans, they're not reliable. You, you're likely to have false positives. You, you, you don't want to trust what your eyes are, sh are showing you. And to some degree, I, I wouldn't argue with that. But I, I think the counterweight to that is we were able, because we did most of this research in ancestry, 
um, before Ancestry made six and seven Santa Morgan matches uh, unaccessible, which is another story for another day. Um, but we, we were able to do this before that happened. And not only did I get a match with a this African match at six Santa Morgans, my sister matched this individual as well. Now at Ancestry, all you have is two people that match this person. You don't know at that point where, you, you don't know a lot. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to contact the the son, and that's the individual. Uh, Tolerunju is the individual that we're showing with. He's got his thumb up, and I've got my thumb up. He's the son of the of the mother of his mother, who we're matching. So I was able to contact him and explain to him, "I know you put your mother in ancestry. Would you please put her in Jed match so we can actually see how she's matching us on which chromosome, and so forth and so on." We can triangulate. We can do a lot more. If we can get you to do that, cousin. Will you please do that? And he said, no problem. Let's do it. He moved her into Jed match. And once we had her there, we were able to triangulate her match on the 16 chromosome with both my sister. And we had another cousin who also triangulated there. And we found a few other people. So, so again, that small segment match started us down the road of moving it out of ancestry in the jet match, looking at it in a chromosome browser, confirming the analysis on the 16th chromosome, finding other cousins that also matched. And so once we got two or three more people in that, in that matching pool, we were able to see that enough of those folks were in the pool on our mother's side to then be able to discern that this was a, a maternal match, meaning this is somebody on my mother's side of the family. One of the cousins that had a, a distant match to our African cousin, she was related to us on the Smith side, Camilla Smith, our great great grandmother. And that's our maternal line. That's our maternal line, which we already had taken uh, the mitochondrial DNA uh, results to run that line all the way back to Africa. We didn't know where, but we knew our line on our mother's 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 side ran all the way back to Africa. So we, we've not necessarily confirmed this yet, but we not only believe that once we were able to uh, confirm that, that specific Smith link to the matching pool that we had, that, that at the same time gave us the indication that this match is going to take us on the, the, uh, the mitochondrial line all the way back to Africa. And since we were able to talk to her son, and have him explain to us that he's from Idwani in, in, uh, in the Yoruba tribal area of Nigeria. Now we have a specific location in Africa where that DNA is from. And so all that was generated from a six Santa Morgan segment match with both myself and my sister, which got the ball rolling to take us where we ended up making this discovery. Thank you, that, that's, that's fascinating. Um, and, and uh, what a story. Hmm. So um, I see Sam Baldwin on here and he's saying to, uh, if you want to find the. Sam's yeah. my man. Uh -huh. And I, I, I wanted to, he's giving some uh, resources uh, to go find a, a transcript of the CVS. Uh, so you can I think, find it was, I think it. it was 1996, but I don't remember the okay. date. Right, right. So he, he's given us, so if you scroll through the chat, everyone, you can see that resource. Uh, thank you, Sam. Okay. And um, yeah, I think, I think we're about done. So you'll get a copy of this. And um, uh, some of you, some of them, some of the guests asked really specific questions. So we'll get you in touch with each other if if that's what you prefer, so. That'd be, that'd be fine. Okay, okay. so um, um, give us give us some just a uh, you got we've got a few minutes so so just um, just your real like people love real so real feelings emotions um, when you can connect place with the people uh, that you're re researching. Um, uh, give us a little insight on on your feelings about that. 
Well, I, 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 I guess just being from, from Baltimore, I, I can say that again, outside of that 1979 discussion, you know, I'm a Baltimore guy. I'm, I'm a city guy. I, I, I don't know. My grand, my older sister will say, and my aunt and other people will, will talk about how my grandfather loved St. Mary's County, was always back and forth to St. Mary's County and so forth and so on. And I know as a child, I was in St. Mary's County because we would go down there for, for different e events and so forth. But all I knew was I remembered I was in the car for a long time. I was probably saying, Mom, are we, are we there yet? And that kind of thing. You know, I don't remember coming to St. Mary's County as a, as a young person. But once I got older and once I asked my aunt for the tape and I listened to the tape and I started hearing things like Drayden and Tuxin and, and Soderly and Hollywood and hearing all these uh, Valley Lee and hearing all these names, all these Southern Maryland names. The first time I actually got in the car and drove down in the Southern Maryland to 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 to, to see to see where all this was happening, and I can remember crossing the crossing the line where I saw the sign. You were entering St. Mary's County, and I just a feeling just came over me because I realized that uh, you know this is where my people were from, and the more you get into the history, when when you think about the fact that. You know, Maryland is one of the 13 colonies. And we had, I kind of alluded to all of that DNA from Europe coming into this, coming up the bay and everybody marrying everybody else. And, and then all these Africans being brought from all over the place. And then in this, in this horrible situation of enslavement where they're all in the environment that they're in. And before you know it, everybody's related to everybody else. You know, you're, you're driving past and it's, it's kind of a mixed emotion thing, because in some instances, you know, you realize a lot of difficult and terrible things happen down here. But you also realize that this is where your your family overcame. This is where they persevered. This is where they survived. This is where they 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 established themselves. And particularly when you see that 1870 census and you start to see these folks that, OK, yeah, they're still close proximity to the previous enslaver because they haven't, you know, gotten everything together yet. They're only six years removed from being free. But then when you move to 1880 or you move to 1900 and you, and you start to see that migration to Washington, to Baltimore, to Philadelphia, as we began to develop and move forward. So then I understand my place being in Baltimore and how that was just an, a, a kind of incremental step from those, from those baby steps, those folks must've been taken in 1870 to get to the point where all these years later, now, you know, we're, we're all over and we're doing, we're doing things and so forth and so on. So to be able to tie that history back, to be able to connect those dots all the way back and bring it all the way forward, that's just priceless. And, uh, you know, and that's why the work that Agnes did, you know, I know she was, I guess she initially wanted to find her family's story as it related to Sodaly, but then I guess once she got started, she goes, well, you know what? I got enough in front of me. I can do the whole county while I'm here. And so then she started grabbing folks to help all of us out. And so I always got to give give big ups to to Agnes King Callum for that, that and all the people that worked with her and, and helped to 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 get that dat that database up and running so that we can see those names before 1870. That That's another priceless thing that just grabs you and just just does stuff to you to know that all that work was done. And so if that's the foundation, if if, if people did went to that level to, to get that work to the place where it's at at this point, then then who are we to kind of shrug our shoulders and, you know, not keep not keep it going. So I'm you know, I'm pounding I'm pounding the table and saying, OK, younger folks, I'm trying to I'm trying to make sure you realize this line of history that we've got here and the significance of it. Uh, and we want to try to make sure, you know, just because once you know, you understand and you can appreciate it and you can immerse yourself in it and embrace it. I don't think you're going to be able to just let that go and go back to the the, 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 the movie or what, whatever, whatever people do today to, to distract themselves or, or involve themselves in other things. Obviously there's other things to do, but I think somewhere you got to carve out a slice for this great, rich American history and, and keep it in the game. 
Fabulous. Um, you had one more question that popped up. Were you able to find out anything about your 20% European ancestors? Yes. Uh, in fact, well, I, I, I think I showed one slide where I showed the, the wheel and the circle. And I talked about mitochondrial and Y DNA taking you all the way back. And we, we're back to Africa on several lines doing that. But we're also in France and in England on a couple of our lines. Our Jordan line goes back goes back to England. Uh, in fact, uh, the Jordan family of, of, of St. Mary's County, that's a whole nother story into and of itself. And um, our Jordan line is kind of interesting in that uh, we cross the color line and we go back all the way to Samuel Silas Jordan. He came to Jamestown in 1610 on the sea venture, the same ship that uh, John Ralph was on, which a lot of people know who he is. He's the guy that married Pocahontas and bought the tobacco and, and, and basically saved the, 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 uh, the fledgling uh, Jamestown folks from starving to death because he finally came up with a cash crop that would work. And so there's still an area on the James River called Jordan's Point. And I was, before this pandemic, I, that was going to be one of my trips to go to, to stand on Jordan's Point because that's where our, our Samuel Silas Jordan came from England in 1610. So, so yeah, we, we, I, we do know some of the lineage on the uh, European side as well. And, you know, like I said, that's why I have that wheel. It's 360 degrees and I don't want to leave anything out. With any information that I find on any spoke, I'm trying to push it back as far as I can and then pass that on to the folks that come behind. Well, um, Mr. Spears, thank you so much for joining us, and um, we appreciate it so much, and we appreciate you. Uh, well, I, I, I hope I hope this was informative <laughs> and helpful, and maybe get some people who haven't decided to dig into their family's history. Hopefully, this will get you motivated and psyched up to want to do that for your own families, because the more people are researching, the more collaboration we can do, and the more we can collectively figure out some of this stuff and break through some of these brick walls. So thank you all as well for everything you guys and solidly are doing uh, as well, because again, it, it's going to take all of us to get from where we are to where we need to be. And people have asked, is this being recorded? It will be put up on eventually give us, give us a little time, but it will be up on our website on, under the vault and our YouTube channel. So um, you'll be able to go back to it. Uh, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you might be able to go back to the link and see it that you already have. You'll get uh, a link to go back and see it. Um, so some of the slides and things, people are really interested in all that information. So they want to go back and uh, go frame by frame. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I'll turn it back over to Nancy now. You know, I see in the chat, so many thank yous, Jerome. I can't even begin to keep track of them all. But I saw one of my dear friends who said, you know, it's this is a uh, wonderful uh, event to to bring that way. Okay. Bring God, I said that out loud. But you never know what what exists out there, and there is common ground out there for us. And you have shown that in so many beautiful ways in your presentation tonight. We are so honored that you did that. Thank you so much. And I was taken by one of the slides with Agnes and John Hansen because that was 25 years ago. That was 1996 when they were on that Today Show. This is the 25th anniversary that Soderley was named one of the 11 most endangered historic sites in America. It almost didn't make it. But these two descendants who were from very different sides of Soderley's stories came together and said, these stories cannot be lost what they can tell us about ourselves are too important. And today here, descendants are still sharing those stories and, and, and enriching us. And Jerome, I thank you so, so much for, for, for the honesty of sharing your story with us and for letting us be part of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. For all of you tonight, there are going to be a lot more wonderful Common Ground programs coming up and speaker series programs. We hope you can join us for 
all of them. The conversation is going to be ongoing. If um, you know, it is a pandemic and it is a um, difficult time as a nonprofit, but we are dedicated to keeping this work going. Um, if you're willing to join us as a member or a monthly donor, do know that your support means that we can keep these wonderful events going. And believe me, you set the bar high tonight, Jerome. We're going to have to make sure we continue this, this wonderful uh, mission to get us together and get us in the conversation. So Jerome, thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for joining us tonight on this historic night, another historic event. Take care. We'll see you all later. Good night all.